meeting in public session. I ask you to turn off your uh, mobile phones, please. There will be apologies from Senator Rose Conway Welsh uh, and Senator Paul Gavin is substituting uh, for her. Uh, the business of our meeting today is to have an exchange with President uh, Mario Draghi. I wish to welcome you to uh, the meeting. Uh, the exchange of views represents a first in terms of the committee engagement with the ECB and it is hoped that it can lead to a greater interaction that will contribute to a greater understanding of the ECB's role in the Irish and wider EU economies. Uh, the ECB's central role in managing monetary stability and safeguarding the Eurozone from external shocks has never been more essential as Ireland faces the uncertainty of uh, Brexit. Uh, today's exchange of views uh, builds on a recent meeting between uh, finance delegation and the chair of the single supervisory mechanism, Ms. Danielle Nioia, in Frankfurt, where the issue of banking supervision in Ireland was discussed in depth. So today's engagement will focus on topics such as interest rates, uh, inflation, Brexit, European Monetary Union developments, forecasts for Ireland, and other European Eurozone economies, and the macroeconomic issues facing the EU nations that use the euro as their common uh, currency. So we set out our arrangements for our meeting today. Each member received uh, an email detailing the arrangements. I'd ask you to please uh, stick to those arrangements so that we can get through as much or as many questions as possible. In terms of privilege, I want to advise the witnesses that by virtue of 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. I want to invite um, President Draghi now to make her opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Honourable Members of Parliament. I'm happy to be back in Dublin and honoured to be invited to speak to the Oroctis. On this occasion, I'm joined my, by my colleague, Philip Lane, whom you meet regularly in his capacity as governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. Now, let me just uh, remind as a housekeeping detail that while the ECB is accountable to the European Parliament, we also greatly value our exchanges with national parliaments. In September, as you just recalled, some of you already met the chair of the supervisory board, Daniel Nui, in Frankfurt, and discussed the ECB's supervisory policies. So one thing is that in full respect of the functional separation between the ECBs, this has to do with what I say, what I can say, what I cannot say. So in full respect of the functional separation between the ECB's monetary policy and its supervisory tasks, Today is an opportunity to discuss our monetary policy and policies to make the euro area economy and its constituent parts more resilient. In this respect, I expect an open exchange from this meeting, which will give us a chance to listen to and better appreciate each other's positions. I'm conscious that I'm speaking uh, in a country that went through a severe crisis. The Irish people made tremendous efforts, and of course, for, for them, we all have, and I personally have, great respect. But we should also acknowledge that these efforts are now, are now paying off. Ten years after the start of the global financial crisis, the euro economy is performing well, and has been performing well for some time. We've now seen 22 consecutive quarters of economic growth, while over 9 million, exactly I was told, 9.2 million jobs being created. And the unemployment rate has declined to 8.1%, its lowest level since November 2008. Now, the Irish economy has seen a particularly strong expansion in recent years. 
Ireland is now growing at the fastest pace of any euro area country. Unemployment has been falling too and now stands well below the euro area average. This is all the more impressive given the severe crisis Ireland went through and the legacies it is dealing with, including high private debt and arrears. Looking ahead, while some sector-specific data and selected survey results have been somewhat weaker than expected, the latest incoming information overall also suggests that the broad-based expansion in the euro area in Ireland is set to continue. Against this background, euro area inflation is expected to continue to converge towards the ECB's objective of below, but close to 2% over the medium term. Getting to this point has required considerable monetary policy support. The euro area is looking back on several years of exceptionally low interest rates and what we call unconventional monetary policy measures. The ECB's key interest rates have been at unprecedented low levels since 2009. They have been supported by a series of unconventional measures introduced in the face of a protracted recession and persistently low inflation. While we are now at the point where we anticipate subject to incoming data confirming our medium-term inflation outlook that we will end net asset purchases at the end of the year, significant monetary stimulus will still be needed to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Even after we end our net asset purchases, however, monetary stimulus will continue to be provided by the guidance we've given, namely that we expect the key, ECB, the key interest rates at their present levels, at least through the summer of 2019, and to maintain the stock of assets on our balance sheet by reinvesting maturing bonds purchased under the asset purchase program for an extended period of time after the end of our net asset purchases. But the overall favorable outlook and our still accommodative stance should not invite complacency. Although on the whole, the risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook can still be assessed as broadly balanced, risks relating to protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility remain prominent. And more specifically, we see a growing willingness to question multilateralism, which has underpinned global growth since the end of the Second World War. The protectionist trade measures implemented may have had very limited effects thus far, but the escalation of trade tensions is certainly undermining confidence. Allow me to say a few words about the euro area financial stability. The financial stability environment in the euro area overall remains favorable, but it has become somewhat more challenging in recent months. The results of the European stress test published last Friday show that euro area banks are increasingly resilient to financial shocks. This, of course, also reflects the continuing economic expansion which has strengthened private and public balance sheets alike. Still, there are risks. They include liquidity risks in the non-bank financial sector that could be transmitted to the broader financial system. And developments in this area should be closely monitored, and a regulatory and supervisory framework for non-banks needs to be strengthened. Asset prices also require close monitoring. While there is no compelling evidence at this stage of overstretched asset valuations at the euro area level, now of course we are seeing some localized risks. However, euro area monetary policy is not the appropriate tool with which to address such risks. They call instead for targeted macroprudential policies which can be tailored to local and sectoral conditions. 
And certainly, the recent decisions of the Central Bank of Ireland are an example of how macroprudential policy can promote financial stability. Now, the other risk that is in, in our minds is Brexit, of course. Now, with the negotiations ongoing and less than five months to go until the United Kingdom's departure from the European Union, it is essential to prepare for all possible outcomes, including a no-deal scenario. While the direct trade effects of a hard Brexit would be limited for the euro area as a whole in the aggregate, of course Ireland is more exposed due to its very close trade relations with the United Kingdom. We also see limited overall risk to euro area financial stability. However, without sufficient mitigating action, a cliff edge Brexit could have an adverse impact in certain areas centrally clear derivatives markets. Source of risks from outside the EU have grown up as well since May. A stronger US dollar and heightened trade tensions triggered renewed stress in a number of emerging market economies. Thanks to our collective efforts at European and national level, we've come a long way since the start of the financial crisis. However, to strengthen our economies and preserve financial stability, we need to go further. Let me highlight in particular some of the concrete steps in the area of financial integration that we need to take at the European level. First, we need to complete the architecture of the banking union. The benefits of having euro area supervisor are clear when we look at banks' strengthened balance sheets. Still, more needs to be done to reduce the risk for citizens as both taxpayers and depositors, and to break the remaining link between banks and national governments. In addition to the adoption of banking package, which is currently under negotiation among EU legislators, a genuine banking union needs further regulatory harmonization. For instance, through greater reliance on regulations instead of directives. In particular, unwarranted national options and discretion still stand in the way of a level playing field for banks. At the same time, we need to establish a common backstop to the single resolution fund and lay the groundwork for the creation of an effective European deposit insurance schemes. scheme. Significant steps in these areas are a precondition for a truly integrated euro era banking system and a single money. The second thing we need to do is build a true single market in capital. To be robust, the capital markets union needs effective regulation and supervision. For example, in relation to investment firms and clearing, not least given the United Kingdom's imminent departure from the European Union, we need to make concrete progress on this agenda and complement it with an ambitious long-term vision. So, in conclusion, I would like to end by mentioning that recent Eurobarometer data show that support for the euro stands at high, record high of 77% among euro area citizens, and a large majority believe that their country's membership of the European Union is a good thing. Support for the European project is particularly strong here in Ireland, where with 88% of citizens, the single currency enjoys the highest level of support in the European Union. So Europe has to repay this trust. We face important global challenges that are naturally causing concern among the people of Europe, especially those who feel left behind. Common institutions and collaboration among member states gives, gives Europe a strong voice in the world. More importantly, they make it possible for us to find effective answers to joint problems. In other words, we are stronger together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Draghi. Uh, we now go to Senator Dahl. Um, welcome, Mr. Draghi, um, President of the ECB, and Kate Mila Falter. Can I just take you up on two issues? Uh, the first issue is Brexit. And you said in your statement that without sufficient mitigating actions, that the a cliff edge 
that the consequences of Brexit, and you might elaborate on that, what type of mitigate, mitigating, mitigating action would you like to see taking place? Uh, what is your hope for, for Brexit in terms of whether it's um, a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit and its implications for Europe and more particularly Ireland? And it's a, as you made reference in your speech, Mr Draghi, we have a, a unique relationship with, with the UK in terms of trading, cultural and, uh, I suppose, social links. Can I follow that on with, uh, you might, uh, the risks and challenges for the Irish economy? And you said we're particularly exposed on the whole area of Brexit. Uh, and you might comment on the fact that our, our GDP growth rates uh, this year will be three times the uh, EU average. Uh, and the fact that we're seeing uh, on the face of it in the last quarter, the growth rate in Europe overall was 0.2%. We are seeing a slowdown overall uh, within the EU. So you might just comment on where you see the risks uh, for the Irish economy, obviously that incorporates Brexit. You may deal with other features. And finally, um, in the context overall of Brexit, what type of policies do you believe um, for an evolving, we'll say, ECB in terms of monetary and, and macro policies in terms of the type of Europe we could have post-Brexit? Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me first uh, answer the, uh, the, the second question. Well, the first question. I'll answer the first question first. So w one thing we keep in mind, and I always say that, we are not party to the negotiation. And, uh, but this doesn't say, doesn't mean that we are not monitoring what's happening. And uh, we support the Commission with the technical advice in our remit. As you may know, we, uh, upon initiative of the Commission, the European Commission and uh, uh, the UK Treasury uh, joint initiative, a working group between the Bank of England and the ECB has been created. Now, now we've also been told that we've got to be sort of not overstepping the, the main negotiators. So this working group has identified various areas, but uh, hasn't yet uh, proceeded or has not been instructed to, to uh, exactly uh, explain what, uh, what ought to be done. Uh, the, but let me first say that the um, impact on the Irish economy is uh, both direct through trade and indirect through financial channels. And it's both direct through trade and finance. As a matter of fact, banks and all the financial system is highly interconnected with the UK financial system. But it's also indirectly in the sense that the Irish financial system, and banking system, finances firms that operate in the United Kingdom as well. So the impact is, is bound to be significant. And uh, now we can silly discuss the various channels. And we're, we're going to be in a better position to know this once the outcome is clear. But one thing that I said in the European Parliament is that the European Union will stand behind Ireland, will back Ireland. And uh, that's quite important in the sense of uh, counting on the, on the closeness and the solidarity of the rest of the European Union. Now, the risks of the... Uh, of, of, uh, the, the area that where we have identified risks is the uh, area of centrally clear derivatives. That's where, but these risks would materialize only if uh, the um, process is what I said on another occasion. There must be a consider considerable degree of mismanagement for these risks to materialize. And uh, uh, all in all, this seems to me unlikely. In other words, the authorities on both sides will be able to manage these risks in a way that financial stability would be preserved. The exact ways in which this action, these mitigating actions will be taken will be clear only when we know the outcome of the negotiation. That's why we've been inviting private parties, especially on, on the European side, We've been inviting the private, the private sector to take all the mitigating actions they can themselves without waiting necessarily 
for having a public intervention because we don't know the outcome yet. So all in all, the picture is, uh, is at least that, that's my own perception, is that, uh, that things can be managed. However, however, if the private sector at some point were to decide that uh, there is going to be a, a cliff edge or an unmanaged process, um, then the private sector's behaviors could be source of instability. And that is something we have to monitor very, very, very closely. Uh, in terms of what's going to happen, you asked me my view. I, I, think, uh, I think the most likely thing is a, is a, is a gradual transition uh, which will allow all parties to negotiate in the best possible way for their citizens. Sorry? A soft yeah. Brexit. Yeah. I, I just, uh, that's my own perception. I'm not. Finally, the risk to the Irish economy. I'm, I'm not, yes, I'm coming to yeah. that in a moment. I'm sorry, I'm taking more time <laughs> than. Now, the uh, Irish economy's performance is strong from all viewpoints for growth, employment, consumption, investment, even housing is now rebounding. Risks. There are two sets of risks. One we've just discussed, and the other one is overheating. It wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time. And there are some legacy vulnerabilities, especially the non-performing loans. So what to do? First of all, um, build fiscal buffers, rebuild fiscal buffers. And that's a good time, because things are going well. So it's, it's the right time to do so. Second, take macroprudential action. And here, you know that uh, the um, Irish authorities, the Central Bank of Ireland, is one of the most active in the macroprudential area in the whole European Union. And uh, in terms of monitoring, of course, watch debt. Watch debt, both public and especially private debt. And again, action to this extent had been undertaken. Low to income, loan to income, loan to service values, loan to capital ratios, uh, the counter cyclical capital buffer. So all actions, all macroprudential actions uh, that have been undertaken in the past are to address these risks. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm taking too long to answer. No, you're okay. You're doing fine. Deputy McCarthy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you're very welcome, President Draghi. My time is limited, so I'll, I'll get to the point. I want to raise uh, two issues with you. Uh, one relates to the transmission of monetary policy to the end consumer. And as you will know, in Ireland, uh, the end consumer pays very high interest rates on debt. Uh, for example, in relation to mortgages, the latest official statistics show uh, the average interest rate paid in Ireland on new mortgages drawn down in the month of August was 3.15%. The average across the Eurozone uh, was 1.77%. So a massive difference of 1.38% or 138 basis points uh, in your language. So for mortgage holders, for businesses, for farmers, Irish consumers are paying very high interest rates and one of the purposes of your monetary policy was to stimulate uh, the economies throughout the Eurozone. Low interest rates are not being passed on to the end consumers in Ireland. Have you a view on that uh, and as to what can be done uh, to try to uh, reduce the interest rates in Ireland, to bring them more in line with rates charged elsewhere in the Eurozone? The second issue, Chair, I want to raise is in relation to the Asset Purchase Programme, uh, which, uh, as you have said, uh, will come to an end uh, at the end of this year. So according to your publications, um, uh, you have purchased just, just under €30 billion Euro of Irish government bonds uh, since 2015. So that accounts for about 23% of our national debt in the form of government bonds. There is other debt as well. So I would like to ask you what you think the impact will be on peripheral countries like Ireland of the unwinding of that programme. We will have about €50 billion Euro of our national debt to be refinanced over the next five years. And the concern is uh, that sovereign borrowing costs will increase significantly for countries like Ireland uh, as you unwind uh, the QE programme and you stop buying uh, new debt. So that is a concern. Uh, only a few years ago, 13% uh, of general government revenue in Ireland uh, was used to pay the interest on the national debt. It has now fallen to 6 7%, but it is a key risk for the Irish economy. Thank you, Chair.
colleagues. Stephanie. Thank right. you. Thank you. Well, the, I'm aware that, um, that lending rates um, by banks to users, both them, be them, um, be, uh, be they uh, the consumers or mortgage holders are, are high, are high. Um, but, but one should ask, why are they high? And the, the evidence seems to say that it's because the market, the banking market, is not competitive. There are monopoly or quasi-monopoly situations here. And uh, so the, the way to address this is twofold. First of all, actions to reduce the degree of monopoly, actions to increase the competition amongst banks, and, by the way, other known banks that may finance the economy. And the second is uh, basically uh, what the European Union is doing to complete the banking union and to give a convincing signal to, in order to create a genuine capital market so that uh, cross-bank cross -bank lending and cross-bank purchases and M&As across countries can be actually undertaken so as to increase the competition. And that's, by the way, one, one thing, okay, no, otherwise this is going to take me too much time and you will certainly not approve. But we can discuss the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of creating a capital market union go well beyond the fact that interest rates will go down and, and borrowers would be, would, be, uh, would be in a better condition. So th these, these, are the, these are the two types of actions. What can be done at the European Union level? Uh, what I said in my introductory statement, uh, try to harmonize the uh, legislations and the regulations in different countries, uh, which is, by the way, today it's considered the main barrier to cross-country to cross uh, bank lending. Um, for example, before, imagine giving a more, there are different regimes for mortgages across different countries, and that certainly prevents a cross-country mortgage lending. That is one, uh, one way. And second, do domestic actions geared to increase competition. The, the second point is about whether our, um, our anticipation of ending the net asset purchase program will create an increase in interest rates on sovereign debt? Well, the, um, the answer is we don't think so. We, because we do expect our monetary policy stay very accommodative even after the end of the net asset purchase program because of our forward guidance on interest rates. When we say interest rates will stay at the present level, uh, at least until through the summer of 2019. And in these years, we've accumulated a very sizable stock of bonds and will continue reinvesting these, in these bonds as they come due for an extended period of time. And as I always remind, we keep uh, a lot of optionality in our message, in our monetary policy guidance. If things were to go worse, then we can always extend the period of time. We can always do change our forward guidance in, uh, in uh, consistently with uh, with the incoming information. Thank you, President Draghi. I'll just come back on on one point um, in relation to the the interest rates charged uh, in Ireland. Uh, to consumers, you described the situation here as a quasi-monopoly situation, if I heard you correctly. I think that is a, a fair statement. Uh, the two pillar banks in Ireland hold about 60% of the mortgage market between them. Competition is very limited. Uh, we would like to see uh, new entrants come into uh, the Irish market. Uh, there are opportunities and there is speculation of uh, engagement with our own central bank, but nothing confirmed. But I just want to re-emphasise the point to you that this means that with each passing month, each monthly repayment for a mortgage holder, they are paying so much more in Ireland 
uh, on a comparable loan uh, than citizens elsewhere in the Eurozone. Your monetary policy is not being transmitted to where it really matters, the end consumer in their households. And I would ask you to consider ways uh, in which you and our own central bank can help uh, to put downward pressure on interest rates in Ireland for the benefit of consumers to bring them somewhere more into line with the normal situation elsewhere in, in the Eurozone. Thank you. Sin tuas ab dragi gus lein gus lindir gan cosha, Mr. Draghi, the Irish people has paid a huge price as a result of bailing out the Irish banking system, and the ECB played a very negative role uh, in that regard, and some would indeed say a very sinister role in increasing the cost on the Irish people. The refusal at the time of the ECB to support the Irish government's desire to burn senior bondholders has cost the Irish people dearly. And even now, the Irish state has been forced to dispose of the floating bonds associated with the odious debt of Anglo-Irish Bank, uh, uh, still at a cost to the Irish people. A decade on, we see that uh, Irish homeowners, those that are struggling uh, with their debts or those who have or were in arrears, uh, are now seeing their loans being sold off to vulture funds. Now, when we speak to the banks, uh, those banks tell us it is as a result of ECB rules that they have to do this, and this is a morally unbearable position. Your colleagues, Mr Draghi, are on the record of saying that you have no preference as to how non-performing loans are dealt with as long as they are dealt with. So can you tell this committee what is your definition of a non-performing loan? Because it appears that our banks have different definitions depending which one you speak to. Uh, the the other question I would ask you is in the context of uh, an ECB rate rise uh, at some time in the future. Uh, my colleague has, has mentioned that at this point in time Irish consumers are paying twice uh, the mortgage interest rates than the EU average and this is something uh, that is completely unacceptable. It is something that Irish business, Irish farmers, Irish mortgage holders are having to, to bear uh, with. Uh, I have published legislation along with Deputy McGrath in relation to where there is a market failure uh, that the central bank could intervene and cap interest rates in such a scenario. Uh, the ECB does not support that concept. Uh, can you uh, lift the restrictions or, or tell us how we should deal with such a situation and how we should protect our citizens given uh, where we are at. And can I ask you do, you, do you share the view of many people in Ireland that the Anglo debt is an odious debt and should no longer uh, be placed as a burden on the Irish people? Well, it's, it's more, than one, more than two questions. As a matter of fact, I'll try to do the best in the time. Well, first of all, I, <laughs> I will dispense with the first question, which is your reconstruction of the past. I, uh, we can discuss this, but uh, just let me say that um, the ECB is, was not entirely negative. No? Things are going well today. It means that all the policy advice that was given in the past was not entirely wrong, after all. It's due, it, I think it's true that much of the progress that we see today is due to the Irish citizens. But certainly, the policy advice was not entirely wrong. So that's one thing I would say. Second, the ECB has supported Ireland quite a lot. The liquidity support that ECB gave during the five years of the crisis, the worst years of the crisis, has been unprecedented and, to my understanding, probably still is unprecedented. It was 100 per cent of Irish GDP, 140 billion. But more generally, since there may be other questions about this, about the past, and after all, the, I see this, this conversation between us also as a way to mend a relationship that's been probably fraught by several divergences and many disagreements in the past. Uh, and so I kind of preparing uh, for this conversation, I ask myself, um, it's how, how, how correct it is today to judge events of a past when many, many things have, been ch have changed since then. So um, I just that, that addresses your first point, but we can come back on this. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Second, do we press banks to dispose, their, to dispose in, a, in a sort of fire sale way, way of their MPL stocks? No, no. You know, we have guidance for that. 
there is a there is a guidance for all banks of the of the European Union. In some countries, including the one I come from, NPLs are high. And they are high for different reasons. In, in, in Ireland, they are high because of the original crisis in the construction sector and because of the recession. In Italy, they are high because of the recession. And, but what we see now today is that these NPLs are going down. And we are not pr without even actually too much pressure from the ECB, simply because the recovery is so buoyant that allows the disposal of the MPLs at terms and conditions that are, by and large, OK. However, we have to distinguish two types of uh, non-performing borrowers. You have the strategic non-performing borrower, and you have the uh, non-performing borrower, which is actually unable because he's, he's, she or he is too, po too poor. You have the uh, social problems that come out of that. But in that case, the, the problem ought to be addressed through a, uh, the right instrument, which could be social policies. It shouldn't be addressed destroying the culture of payment between banks and borrowers. So I see a great scope for countries that, uh, where non-performing loans are a, a social issue to address this issue with the proper tool. I'm not ignoring the problem at all, because we, we view, I mean, we see that, that it's a serious problem in many, many countries. The EBA has a definition of non-performing loan, and uh, 90, days due. 90 days due, yes, 90 days due, that was the definition of, uh, of the of the non-performing loan given by the EBA. The, um, well, you, you made the same point about interest rates. I think the, the answer there is really increased competition. And this action can come from two sources, domestic government and European Union. And any support that you can express in the European Union to move forward on harmonizing legislation, especially Delicate issues, but they have to be resolved. We've been discussing this for years now, the insolvency laws. If we have a different insolvency legislation in different countries, banks will always hesitate to lend money in jurisdictions where they don't know what the insolvency law is going to be. So that, that is one, one of the many actions. But certainly things, by the way, uh, have improved with the creation of one supervisor. So. Progress is there, but admittedly is much slower than uh, certainly I would like to see. I've been, I mean, I've been saying exactly the same things now for years. So that's the, and finally it's about uh, the Anglo, Anglo debt issue. Well, we can, um, um, can I say this or I'm over time? No, no, you can say All it. Right. Right. Now, we, we, can, we, can, we can discuss it in more detail, but basically what we cannot, uh, we meaning the Eurozone, uh, what the Eurozone treaties and the cannot afford, cannot accept, is monetary financing. And that's a case of monetary financing, basically. It's the, it's the government, I'm just the bottom line of a very complex reasoning, it's the government that created bonds in order to recapitalize a bank. Now these bonds are in the portfolio of the Central Bank of Ireland, they pay an interest, and if you don't do anything, if you don't sell, this all interest goes back to the government, which means financing at zero cost. And that's not possible given the treaty. We have an article one, two, three that prohibits monetary financing. The, the, the reality is those bondholders should have been burnt and the ECB didn't support the Irish government when a cabinet decision was taken to burn senior bondholders. It is now the policy of Europe if such an event were to happen that there would have been a bail-in of senior bondholders. All the advice wasn't correct and indeed not everything is great in Ireland. The GDP figures are going well, recovery is going well, but Michael was the 27th person to die in our streets in our capital city in the last 16 months. He's homeless. Sorry, let me just yeah, finish. Definitely. Let me just finish. There's 4,000 children who
who won't have a home and will sleep in emergency accommodation and wake up on Christmas Day. So not everything is going well, but I just want to point out, I want to ask you, particularly in relation to NPLs and the European Commission's proposal for a suite of legislative measures in relation to this. One proposal includes the rules for establishing a vehicle to buy non-performing loans without breaching state aid rules. Uh, and I'm sure the ECB is familiar with NAMA that was established here in, in the Come to the question. Yes, yeah, this is, this is the question. Uh, would a NAMA for mortgages be permissible uh, for the ECB as a way of Ireland dealing with the NPL issue and avoiding the sales of vulture funds? Uh, and your views in relation to MEPs' proposals so to, towards the legislative proposals, uh, particularly the refusals that their loans would be sold to another institution? Deputy uh, we've seen the Commission uh, propose, I mean, there are different options. We don't have a preference amongst different options, frankly. We'll have to see exactly the details. But let me add one thing, however, which doesn't apply to NAMA as such, but it applies to the whole, uh, to the whole sets of problems or whole sets of issues that arise from, uh, from, um, from these agencies. You know, um, these initiatives have taken place in many other countries of the European Union, the creation of specialized agents. The issue is, in our view, that's not the main issue. We, if it helps, uh, why not? Uh, can it be done without violating the rules, the state aid rules? That's the key question. Um, it's always, it looks always quite difficult. It's not in our domain, however. Uh, thank you, and uh, you're very welcome here, Mr. Draghi. Um, ten years uh, after 2008, uh, does the ECB admit errors in its own conduct after the crash? The IMF, one of your sister organisations, did, and published new guidelines. What I want to ask you of the ECB not least its conduct in Ireland, where honestly it was probably the most rigid and most conservative of all three Troika members. I appreciate you were not president then. You did not make threats about bombs going off in Dublin. Uh, we're all aware of that. But, you know, your tenure of the bank is passing. And um, while... Uh, you might be described as something of a Keynesian, and all the better for it, in my view. I'm not so sure about your successors. Now, I just want to ask you about here in Ireland, but in many European countries, a real threat to our democracies, which is effective housing market failure. Do you recognise that that's happening in a number of European countries? and uh, people and families on low income or state support, they're struggling to pay or get an affordable rent or to buy a home, which has been a hallmark of European economic progress over a long time, either purchase on a mortgage or a long lease. Do you feel that people on low wages, you referenced a 2% interest rate, uh, uh, or 2% inflation rate, a bit low, might be better if it was about 3 and that was reflected in higher wages, particularly for low-paid people. That people on low wages who can't get housing are the left behind that you referred to in your opening remarks. You also talked about the slogan, uh, Stronger Together. In Gaelic, in Ireland, there's a similar phrase, Niñart gur curla cela. And really, I want to ask you, can you give expression to the very fine sentiments in your opening remarks that might give hope to people who don't have houses, who don't have affordable rents, and who don't have a job which pays a decent amount of money and gives them some security? Thank you. Um, well, you are asking a lot from the ECB. The, um, our policy is now kept interest rates at such low level for an unprecedented period of time. Um, we've 
complemented this policy with the, the purchases of assets, both government and private corporate bond assets. So, in a sense, it's been a policy that has helped debtors and um, helped entrepreneurs, helped the private sector, helped governments, and to the extent that uh, it um, actually engineered the recovery, also helped banks, helped insurance companies, helped pension funds, which complain a lot about low rates, but they should complain less, thinking that if the recovery had not taken place, the exposure of the banks would have been much higher, the NPLs would be much higher, the non-payment, the, non, uh, the clients that would not be able to pay back would be, would be many more. So this policy is now producing a concrete result. So I was saying at the beginning, the economy is improving everywhere. The main drivers are uh, consumption and investment. This year, more than exports. Last year was more exports. But the most comforting data is actually there are two, two, uh, in my view, most important data. One is the employment data, the number of jobs created. As I was saying, 9.2 million, never, never so many jobs being created in five years in, uh, in the whole European Union. And the second is the dispersion. Uh, you see, at the beginning of the crisis, we had, we had countries which were doing very well, or well, which were doing relatively well, and countries which were not doing well at all. So the dispersion in growth rates was high. Now, currently, the dispersion is at the lowest level historically. And that is also a sense of, uh, of, of comfort. And this has been achieved through low rates. Now, the issue is often we are asked to, uh, we are told by people that, uh, that our uh, asset purchases are actually benefiting the ones who own assets, namely the wealthy part of the population. Well, as a matter of fact, we went through a quite elaborate search here, trying to assess the distributional effects of our policies. And uh, certainly, asset prices go up, and assets are more or less, by and large, owned by rich people. But also, you have the reduction in unemployment. And the, the most important cause for income and wealth inequality is unemployment. So the two effects offset each other, and by and large, the monetary policy is being pursued has not increased, if anything, has improved distribution. Also consider that that's again as to, has two sides. The increase in the value of houses has improved mostly the low income but house owners in many, many countries. Now specifically here, there are issues that have to do where the ECB can't do much about that because there are sort of constraints to supply that uh, constrain the housing market. This is my understanding. And these constraints, however, are, are, getting, are getting less and less binding, if I understand well, namely construction supply is going up. So all in all, we should be waiting for less price pressures on housing. So it's, also it's also true that thanks to the recovery, demand is also buoyant in the housing market. So, all in all, uh, I think our policy has helped people. And uh, one of the parameters we always look at is exactly what you mentioned before, namely wages. What's happening to nominal wages? We look at that because for us it's the best predictor of inflation, which is our objective and is in our mandate. And uh, recent data, the last, uh, say, six to 12 months data, show that wages are gradually going up. And, uh, and they are going up not because of uh, temporary effects, but more and more because of permanent effects. So wages in Germany have been uh, going up, uh, in the euro area have Sorry. been going up by, in, oh, in Ireland it's two and a half percent, which is a, a, a figure which is higher, if I understand, slightly higher than the euro area average, certainly higher than many other countries. So. It's been a big crisis. It's taken a long time to get out of it. But, uh, 
Can I just say, sometimes the next crisis is in, uh, arises from the failure to deal with a current crisis, which may not be as big as 2008, and housing and the affordability of a place to live is now a factor in many uh, European cities. Next Sunday as well, as you know, is the 100th anniversary of the end of the very first World War, and the failure to actually uh, give, allow people to have dividends in terms of their ordinary lives. You were the person who said, and I agree with you, nobody to be left behind. What I'm asking you is how practically, as an economist, as the head of the European Central Bank, uh, notwithstanding monetarism, how do you give effect to that in relation to the young people who don't have jobs and aren't included in the employment statistics, and the young people and families who can't afford to either rent or buy a house, here particularly, but also in a lot of other European uh, countries. Mr. Draghi, short response? Yeah, well, I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I gave a speech in Dublin last time I was here exactly on, on youth un, on unemployment and youth unemployment especially. Uh, there, there are many, many causes, of course, but what the central bank can do is to pursue consistently, firmly, its mandate. And its mandate, that we call price stability, actually captures a variety of dimensions more, much, much broader than simply price stability. And um, indirectly, of course, because our mandate is defined in terms of price stability, which means, which has meant to fight deflation, to fight and to fight all the causes that would cause deflation or too low inflation. And so that's, that's uh, how our, money, our monetary policy came to be through the crisis and that's how it is and still is, as a matter of fact. Perfect. Thanks. Mr. Draghi, the last time I had a chance to question you was in the European Parliament in December 2011. And at that time, I asked you about the ransom note that yourself and Mr. Trichet had sent to the then Italian government. I'm sorry, the ransom note. Uh, the the letter, ransom note. The letter which contained oh, the, letter. the whole it's series of... It's called letter, yes. The yeah, letter. So it, yeah. It's not the only ransom note which yeah, yeah, the ECB yeah, yeah. Has, has sent. Okay. But it, it had the character of a ransom note, of a series of requests yes. for austerity yeah. measures and a clear implication that the ECB would not be buying bonds if they weren't implemented. Um, and I was asking about that letter uh, to explore the undemocratic role which the ECB was then playing in the service of a model of authoritarian neoliberalism and which was strengthened with the whole process of European economic governance. Um, you didn't answer me on that day. There was many questions, so thankfully we have space today to return to that question. And in the past seven years, I think we have a lot of evidence to prove that that's the case, that the European Central Bank has been playing a fundamentally undemocratic role in the service of bankers uh, and very much not in the service of ordinary people. Um, that ranges from its role in the removal of elected governments in Italy and in Greece in November 2011, uh, its role in foisting European bankers' debt on people in this country, which on a yearly basis we're still seeing billions burnt as a consequence of that by the central bank. Uh, it includes the strangulation of the Greek banking system in 2015 in order to try to ensure an outcome of a democratic uh, referendum. Um, and so I return to that question today and ask how do you stand over, how do you defend the role that the European Central Bank has played over the course of the last decade? How do you defend its fundamentally undemocratic character? And do you intend that that kind of role will continue? Mr. Draghi. Thank you. I mean, you make the ECB very, very powerful. I think more powerful than it is. Removing governments is not the task of the ECB. Uh, it's the task of, uh, of, the, of the voters of, of the different countries that, uh, that elect these governments. Uh, it's, but it's the task of parliaments, but it's certainly not the task of the ECB. Now, you are referring to the fact that under certain conditions, the ECB cannot continue to support a country through 
bonds purchases or through provision of emergency liquidity assistance, which, by the way, is a decision of the National Central Bank and not of the ECB. So that's what you're referring to. Um, and, you know, I mean, the ECB has its own rules. The ECB lends money against collateral to solvent banks. If banks are not solvent, the ECB cannot lend money. If the collateral quality drops below a certain, certain level, that collateral cannot be accepted any longer. And often this collateral is formed by government bonds. So to the extent that the policy of a certain country affects the value of these government bonds, the policy of the country becomes important for maintaining the support of the ECB. That's been the rule according to which the ECB has behaved in the many instances that you mentioned. Now, of course, the relationship between different countries can take different shape. The support, liquidity support can take different shape. But the substance is what I said before. The policy affects the quality of the collateral. The collateral is fundamental to maintain the liquidity support, and therefore the ECB. And, but, but it's not that the ECB wants to sort of dictate a policy. By the way, in answering also the previous question, I was asked that there's one thing I should say. Of recent, the ECB is carving itself a different role in the dialogue, in the policy dialogue with countries, much more limited to the financial stability part of the policy dialogue and less extended to other parts, like the fiscal part or, or other parts. In other words, it's the financial stability and to the extent of fiscal sustainability only insofar affects. It affects financial stability. But, no, but the ECB won't talk about infrastructures or privatizations or other things like that, which, which used to be in the past, we used to do in the past in the, in the sort of early versions of the Troika. Just to respond to that, I mean, I, I don't agree with your assessment of what the ECB has done. Um, it is a fact that the EC Can I say something? ECB... You would like to see an ECB which provides unlimited, unconditional support, liquidity support to a country no matter what. I would like to is see, this what you want to I, see? I would like to see an ECB that is under democratic control, no. as yeah. opposed to the illusion of independence, which in reality means that it acts in the interests of the big banks. Well, you, no. you said, uh, Mr. Draghi, that the ECB isn't into dictating policy. Read the letter that you wrote to the Italian government at the end of 2011, uh, uh, or, or read the letter that your predecessor wrote to the finance minister here, which was published, um, what, a few years ago, which is very clear about threatening, and this is Triche, this is the head of the European Central Bank, threatening the withdrawal of emergency liquidity assistance one day after the governor of the Central Bank, who sits on the governing council, had gone on the radio without informing the government to announce that a bailout was going to be needed, clearly designed to push Ireland into a bailout and into saving the European banking system, for which people have paid the price. And just finally to come to the present, because this continues. Look at the situation of the Italian government today, a government that I have nothing in common with in terms of politics, a government whose racist politics I abhor, but a government which is elected and has a right to set a budget. What's currently happening, they have set a budget, the European Commission says we don't accept the budget, you have added pressure onto the Italian government against the budget by your comments that have been reported no. in the press today. Not well, true. you can, you can respond on If you can quote that. these comments, they have, I'd be grateful. They, 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 Yes, Please, do I, quote, I will. Do it's, report, quote the it's reported by Reuters today. Please, do quote the comments. It's reported by Reuters today. Oh, it's yes. Right. Did so I, I will. say no, but, but, and, and The Italian government can not face true. fines if not they true. don't accept the diktats of the European no, Commission. No, no yeah, diktat. By the way, um, when, uh, when, uh, when, you ask, when you say that the ECB, let me say two things only. When you say that the ECB is, uh, is in, acts in the interest of bankers, just ask them. Please ask them whether they like the low interest rate policy, whether they like the monetary policy, just ask them or read any German newspaper about that. Um, now, the second point is that actually you would like to see the ECB providing unlimited, unconditional, eternal liquidity support, no matter what. This is what you're saying. Well, this is not consistent with our rules. Uh, Thank Bork. you.
Thank you, uh, Cahirlach, and I thank Mr Draghi for taking time to attend our committee meeting. Uh, just two uh, brief questions. Uh, just first of all, in relation to uh, what Deputy McGrath mentioned in terms of um, the capacity of our economy to grow in terms of servicing our national debt. Uh, obviously, our national debt uh, for 2018 is around €205 billion. Euro. It's uh, somewhere in the mid-60s in terms of our GDP ratio. And obviously, uh, the amount of our national uh, budget that's required to service that debt is quite significant. Um, I think back in 2017-18, it was just over 3 per cent and peaked at somewhere around 15 per cent. And obviously, 25 per cent of our national debt is made up of banking debt in terms of to uh, rescue the banking system. And I just want just your views in terms of, you know, how aware you are in terms of how vulnerable we are in terms of that liability uh, on our balance sheet and with the view of the um, asset management programme ending, what implications that would have. And secondly, I just want to ask in terms of our rainy day fund, which was established by our government uh, this year, uh, putting 500 million in from uh, the budget and one and a half uh, billion, I think, from our investment bank. Uh, and just in terms of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council did make a point in terms of the fiscal rules have an inability to deal with the counter-cyclical nature by which a rainy day fund will be deployed. So in other words, when it comes round to actually spending that fund, um, that uh, the fiscal rules are imperfect in terms of dealing with that. And I would like your views on that, please. Thanks. Sir. Thanks. So the first question is really, I mean, let me say that we don't comment on... Um, generally speaking, on the details of the fiscal agenda of the individual countries. But the fact is that Ireland has gradually improved its fiscal position over recent years and recording primary surpluses, supported by some favorable cyclical factors and low interest payments. Uh, and it and keeps on improving. I understand the budget discussions that have taken place in this committee uh, are, um, are showing that the improvement continues. The draft budget plan foresees a balanced budget in 2019, and for the first time since 2007, there's going to be a fiscal surplus in 2020 and beyond. So given the uh, current uh, buoyant economy, it's time to rebuild fiscal buffers. That's the best way to deal with incoming risks that we mentioned before, overheating and, uh, and uh, possibly Brexit. I think that's, the, that's my answer to, to your, your first question. On the second question, I should say about the rainy, rainy days fund, I don't know enough to answer your question on that. But certainly, if, if it falls in the category of building fiscal buffers, for the, uh, for the um, situations where things are not going to be as good as they are today, that is a wise thing to do. Yeah, our Fiscal Advisory Council actually issued a paper in terms of its concern about the capacity of uh, us to release the fund in a counter-cyclical manner without being in breach of uh, fiscal rules. So maybe it's something uh, your uh, office or the bank might take a look at. Thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Deputy. Thank you. Uh, Senator Harkin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Draghi, for coming here for our special meeting. And you are very welcome. And I've been impressed by your opening statement in terms of your knowledge and in your responses, your knowledge of the Irish economy, and a lot of the points have been covered. But just in terms of where at the moment the finance committee, the select committee, is going through the finance bill just after our budget. Uh, the last budget was relatively uncontroversial. We have low interest rates. It's been alluded to our national debt is costing less than it might be. Uh, we have extra corporation taxes coming in at a, at a rate that was never predicted. Um, but we do have a lot of, as has been alluded to, a high level of public and private debt. And just look, from your perspective, you're looking at us, we're here all day, every day. Um, the challenges that we have in terms of we have a very significant dependence on a small number of FDI, foreign direct investment companies, contributing almost half our corporation tax receipts. Um, you're not responsible for it, but CCCTB and digital taxation and so on. Has the ECB looked at, we've been told CCCTB is not a bad thing for the EU as a whole, but we don't have any country specific um, or country by country analysis of how that would work. I would have a concern that if any of those top 10 payers who are contributing, the top 10 companies are 40% 
of our corporation tax. If any of those companies was to disappear or change their location or um, move to a different jurisdiction, that we would be very exposed very quickly. Have you any thoughts on that? Thank you. Well, it, 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 I, should, I should say that uh, uh, exactly in the spirit of the previous uh, questions, um, the ECB should refrain from dealing with, uh, with the taxation issues, especially with composition of, tax, uh, of taxation. Uh, so I'll, my remark is going to be naturally pretty general. Um, clearly, when, uh, when the tax revenue comes from a highly concentrated source, it's, uh, it's by its definition, by its nature, very vulnerable to changes, to changes in the economy, to changes in the composition of the taxpayers. So initiatives that tend to increase the diversification of the tax revenues are only to be welcome because they make tax revenues more, more stable. I think that's, that's the general remark. Going into more detail, I should refrain exactly in the spirit of an ECB, which doesn't want to deal with all the details of an economy, as, uh, as, uh, as we might have done it uh, six, seven, nine years ago. Okay, well, just, just, uh, Things change. Things change. In terms of the, I mean, I, I respect your honesty in terms of the quasi-monopoly that we have in terms of the banks, or just what you're suggesting is there, our pillar banks. Is there any way you can see in terms of increasing competition? Is it all about integration, making the rules more equal across the, the, the Eurozone? Um, certainly, we don't have the ability at the moment to get a source of mortgage in Germany or a source of mortgage in France where interest rates are much cheaper. Um, do you see that as a possibility and the barriers that are there, how can we help dismantle those barriers so that I can go to Germany or France and source a mortgage to buy a house in Ireland? Yeah, I think the, um, what, the, what the Commission is doing to this extent is going to be the, um, the future for the banking system in, uh, in, um, in Europe. Uh, complete the banking union, create a capital market union. Um, we, this certainly will lead to opening up the Irish financial services to competition. There are... Um, my perception is that this is going to change for the better in the future, coming also from domestic competition, coming also from the non-banking sector, so that uh, the natural course of events is one where people will find it easier to access credit, not more difficult. The, it's, the, if there is one sector where the barriers to entry are going to be overcome, that's the retail banking sector. It seems to me that the whole business model is changing fast. You remember we used to have, we used to have banks with lots of branches and lots of people working in the branches. Now all this is by and large gone today. So the sector is changing fast. And it's changing in the direction of providing services to clients. So that's, but that's, that's the way to address this problem. To thank, I mean, to thank you, we were, I was part of the delegation, I, was, I led the delegation to the ECB and the SSM, and I, we found it, I think, very useful in terms of the interaction, but I would encourage this committee and indeed you and your successor to uh, participate in dialogue with the National Parliament. I think it has been useful, and I think the more of us that we have, uh, the better. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Riley. You're very welcome, Mr. Daji, and thank you and the EU in a general way for your support during the Brexit negotiations. Uh, I have to go for a vote, so you have to excuse me. Uh, but I really wanted to ask you this question, which others have put to you, and, and to bring the argument beyond where you've already answered as to why we can't access lower interest rates in Europe for our SMEs, for our mortgage holders. Um, what domestic action would you advise? And I know you've spoken of harmonisation, so I'd prefer you didn't go down that road. If there was some specific EU action that you could speak to and some specific domestic action from your knowledge of where we're at in our country. Um, because, like other speakers, I've been over to, to see Germany. You, can I ask you to repeat the question? What specific action or domestic what, action about yeah. what? About In relation to SMEs, small business, medium enterprise oh. business borrowers, and mortgage holders, borrowers, to access the lower rates that are available in the rest of Europe? Yeah, the, you know, the answer there is really competition. 
is increased competition in the banking services. The Situation of the SMEs credit rationing, where credit was rationed especially to the SMEs, it was a situation that was pretty common in the whole Eurozone until, uh, I would say, three, four years ago. Then things started to improve. In many other parts of the Eurozone now, SMEs have, uh, well, let me give you another, another example of. Can I really apologize? But is, is there any specific action that we can take here in our government or that you can take in the EU that can help us address this with some immediacy? Increased competition between banks, bank holders. My understanding here is that SMEs have a hard time to get credit for this reason, namely the presence of a monopoly or quasi-monopoly, and probably other parameters like uh, the um, default history of the economy that shows a high probability and therefore increasing difficulty in giving credit to a small and SME. And now, this is going to wash out with the recovery. The probability of default will go down and naturally credit should go up. So the big limitation here is the monopoly, the presence of a monopoly, and that should be dealt with. Now, there are there is a natural way of doing it, waiting, but it's a slow one. So if the government can take actions to this extent, namely to reduce the degree of monopoly, that is welcome. And is there any specific action you'd recommend? I would know. Each country has one. Okay. Thank you very much, and I apologize for having to leave. Thank you. The, the senators are leaving for a vote um, in the other house, so that's the, they'll be back later on. Could I uh, put it to you, Mr. Draghi, that... Uh, when you look back, we have to learn from, from history and, and from our mistakes. And uh, at one session here, uh, we had an employee of, of a, an Italian bank, uh, Jonathan Sugarman. I know you're familiar with him uh, because the case was put to you in the European uh, Union by, I recall, Luke Ming Flanagan and perhaps others. Um, that particular uh, action in that bank, publicly, it was never seen that Jonathan Sugarman was acknowledged in any way for bringing forward uh, the serious um, wrongdoings in the bank. And no one publicly knows whether it was addressed or not. So for all in sundry looking in at it, it would appear that the honest whistleblower working alongside the appropriate legislation, reporting a bank with sizable difficulties, was ignored. The second thing is the issue was raised with you about the bondholders. Bondholders are in the business uh, for taking risk and they actually apply their interest rate based on the kind of risk that they're taking. So why wouldn't you burn the bondholders uh, or a certain number of them or a cohort of them? And then you come to the bank profits today we're talking about Irish banks, and if you look at the profitability of the Irish banks, 1.5 billion, perhaps in two cases when the final figures come out, but certainly they're into the high level of, of profitability. Now, in order for Europe, would you say, it has to repay the trust. And I acknowledge that we've had help from Europe. But the question now is, if you are to have a policy of together we are stronger, you have to look at the people. You have to go beyond the institutions that this government here in Ireland at the time and since and the European Union have helped. And you have to look at how you help the individual citizen in these states. So when I look at that, we, our immediate problem is that the banks are almost without being controlled here, I'm afraid to say. They're making their money. They're selling their uh, non-performing loans and blaming Europe for it. Uh, they are then selling to vulture funds who are not regulated. And I understand from a recent exchange with some European Union officials that you intend to introduce some form of same regulation as we have here in Ireland, which essentially is light touch regulation for the vulture funds. And meanwhile, ordinary Irish citizens and others living here in this country are being thrown out of their home. Thousands upon thousands of Irish land, agricultural land, 
is now held by vulture funds. So because of what happened way back then, we are still paying for it. We talk about the recovery, we see a certain amount of recovery going on around us, but it hasn't affected a huge, it has not been beneficial to a huge number of people that are still finding it difficult to uh, put their lives back together again. And this is because, you know, central bank rules about, you know, um, uh, credit bureau and reporting and so on has affected the ability of small businesses to raise money. And against that then you had it from Deputy McGrath, Deputy Doherty and others uh, about the interest rates. You say that interest rates, it's the banking, the market and, you know, they, 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 they will reduce rates according to competition. There is so much bad debt in the banks that uh, arising from the crash that they won't reduce their rates. They could perfectly well do it because of the amount of money they're making. But to see them throwing people out of their homes and bringing, dragging them, kicking and screaming through the courts in Ireland is something that no society should tolerate. Uh, and we look to the central bank here and to the European Central Bank to acknowledge in some way the plight of ordinary people who are faced with difficulties in their lives, who are part of the European Union and who deserve to be recognised and supported from the European Union and through the Irish government. And that is the real difficulty that we have here. That, you know, there isn't competition in the banks because of what happened in the past. The interest rates are not right because of what happened in the past. And people in their homes are now being threatened because of what happened in the past. And we've seen that the, the system just wants to ignore them. And today it would be unfair not to bring all of that to your attention. You may not be as powerful uh, um, ECB to deal with all of that, but I have to say to you, on behalf of the people that I represent, they do not experience the recovery as much as the European Union would tell them it's happening. It's not happening. And the banks here are a disgrace. And I want to say to you, in terms of the tracker mortgage issue, which I'm sure you're familiar with it, it's just outrageous how they rift off the ordinary people in this country, their customers, and they still drag their heels to this day and refuse to recognise the, the plight of people and the situation that they've put, them, put these people into. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, you raised many, many, many issues that, uh, and most of them really the ECB can't do much about that. But in, a sense, in a sense, our duty again is to go with our mandate and try to deliver our mandate. We are doing this with, uh, with our monetary policy and uh, with interest rates that are as low as ever. Now, one specific thing is about the, uh, the MPL and the disposal. Incidentally, as I said before, the ECB isn't pushing. We have a guidance and there is a dialogue and the dialogue is going very well between banks and the ECB all over the Eurozone as far as disposal of the MPLs are concerned. But one thing I think you mentioned yourself, if these MPLs were not to stay on the balance sheet of the banks, the banks could actually have lower their lending rates because their costs would be lower. So if there is a, a situation where in a quasi-monopoly or monopoly situation, if you lower costs, they would uh, actually be able also to lower rates. Now, we said before that disposing of the MPLs is not a simple matter. And it's not a simple matter also from a social viewpoint, because many of the MPLs are with people who cannot pay, are poor people. But then the, that social problem should be addressed with social measures, with fiscal, with budgetary measures, rather than interfering in the, in the interest rate setting mechanism and uh, probably, probably sometimes undermining the bank stability. So that is the first uh, sort of rough answer that I, that I feel like, uh, like giving. Um, now, on more specifically, I'm grateful for you asking the uh, question relatively to Mr. Sugarman, uh, because 
there's a good pos a good chance, a good opportunity to for me to say uh, to say to say everything about that. Which, by the way, I had already discussed this matter in a written answer to the member of the European Parliament, Mr. Flanagan, and this answer was dated December 22nd, 2016, and this letter is published on the ECB's website. So, if people want to know, they can just look at that. So, on the specific case of unicredit you raised in line with the established principle of separation between monetary policy and banking supervision, the specific thing falls in the competence of the chair of the ECB supervisory board, Daniel Nui. Also, I can't really comment on an individual bank supervised institution on the supervisory measures taken with respect to that bank. However, Allow me to address your questions by first clarifying what powers the ECB banking supervision has to address breaches by significant banks. So we have a variety of supervisory tools at hand and including sanctioning powers. The clarifying all these issues, I, won't, I will save you all the powers that we have because it's a, it's a long list, but I would like to reassure you that in my previous capacity as governor of Banca d'Italia was never ever notified of the issue you raised. Also understand that, uh, as was also stated publicly before this parliament, the Central Bank of Ireland carried out an in-depth investigation into this case and considers the matter to be closed. That's about it. So it's been discussed, it's in the website, everything's been done, it's measures have been taken, I can't comment on the specific measures, and as the governor of the other side of the bank, I was not notified and didn't know anything. And the Central Bank of Ireland had fully inquired and declared the matter to be closed at the time. Um, I, I completely, I completely uh, uh, agree with you that uh, we have to look at people. And frankly, in pursuing our mandate, as, as at the best of our possibility, we are doing that. We are doing that. Now, the, more specifically, on the, on the vulture funds, what is, um, uh, first of all, this is a big development in, uh, in the euro area. The size of EU non-banks financial sector uh, has increased, uh, on average, 83% annually between 2012 and 2015. Bond funds, which you call vulture funds, have increased the liquidity transformation, credit, and interest rate risk taking. The European ETF sector remains small compared to traditional mutual funds. But certainly, if you, if you look at that, uh, regulatory, further regulatory work is absolutely needed in this sector. Uh, until uh, not long ago, uh, people used to say that since, um, since, they, since the non-banking sector uh, doesn't, do, doesn't have deposits and uh, it's kind of different from banks, doesn't need to be regulated, um, I think this is not true any longer. These non-banks actually do exactly the same things as banks. They do finance the economy, they take deposit, they give credit, and they're very interconnected with other institutions. So they, they deserve to be regulated. And so the, what the ECB has recommended is that this work uh, would continue, proceeds further, and especially macroprudential tools be extended to the non-banking sector. So including, your, including what you mentioned before, the vulture funds. I just conclude with this, uh, Mr. Draghi, that I, I, I accept that what you're saying in relation to Mr. Sugarman, but particularly the, the, the complaint that he made. It may be closed, but the fact of the matter is, arising from that complaint and other, and, and what happened, in fact, back then, nobody went to jail, nobody is being pursued, um, and we're constantly told that the regulations are being strengthened. But the citizens that we represent don't see it that way. Jonathan Sugarman doesn't see it that way. And I certainly don't see it that way. 
And I would say to you that while we're measuring things here in terms of, of the financial circumstances of the country and the European Union, the social devastation that has been caused in Ireland by the crash, by the vulture funds, is, is absolutely horrific. And it continues to this day. And it's wrong to say that we are experiencing a recovery. We're not. We're, we're, we're certain companies, certain parts of the country are. But there's a vast amount of people still caught in the courts trying to deal with the banks. They're being, their homes are being taken from them. And that may be the need for a social policy. But the, the, the consequences of the financial policies are causing all of this to happen. And while you say that the vulture funds should be regulated, between now and the time they're regulated, people will have died by suicide. That was what has happened in this country. And people will have lost their homes. And we continue to burn money in the central bank every month. And I just think that it's wrong that a bank or an institution that represents the people of the European Union should not flex its muscle at least and say that the social consequences are too much and that countries need to intervene. And that in some way you tell the banks here in Ireland, through the central bank, Mr Lane, that they're not going to get away with it anymore. But they continue to get away with it. And I, I would ask you finally, because community banking has been touched on, credit unions and community banking should be given some sort of special place in order for them to uh, perform. Because it's, it's that type of business structure that actually has saved the people on the lower end of the ladder borrowing small amounts from credit unions, borrowing small amounts from banks like Sparkison. The only place you can get money today in Ireland for the SME sector is from the very same funds who are charging astronomical rates for it and they're going around the country engaging with people, giving loans and putting further risk in place for the economic development of Ireland. And I have to say that to you in respect of those that I have engaged with and the experiences that they have had. Now, we've been joined by, by Deputy Ryan, who asked me earlier on for a few minutes, and I'm going, to your indulgence, I, I, I want to. Just one short question. Uh, Mr. Drag, I very much enjoyed listening to your contribution earlier. One short question. One of our two pillar banks, AIB, um, the state had to rescue during the middle of the financial crash. We bought 100, we took 100% equity. Um, the, the government three years ago, or two years ago now, was it, um, it was sold in an IPO, I think a quarter of the stock uh, at a price of 440 euros a share. Uh, the shares today, I think, are trading a 10% discount on that. Uh, the bank... Um, has lost its CEO and its CFO recently, uh, and I know it's the, the central bank, European Central Bank, doesn't get involved in micromanagement of. But this is not a small issue in terms of what is the strategy this state should pursue uh, pursue in regard to the ownership of such a bank. Are we better, do you think, retaining in public ownership, or are, is there? Uh, how do we? How would we manage that situation? It would be hard to issue a share price again, which is below what the price we issued two years ago. Um, the bank is, uh, has a long history and, and, and record, a very, a very important one in this country. As you say, it's in a market where the whole world is changing. They have all these branches, but do we, how do the branch system work anymore? So I'd just be interested in whether the European Central Bank looks at such issues or has any advice for a government which uh, has to come to decisions on, on the ownership of such a bank. Unfortunately, I can't really comment at all about that. We never comment, I never comment about individual institutions, and frankly, I wouldn't know what sort of advice I could do because I'm not in that, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, business. Thank you. Okay, we'd agree to conclude at 4.45, so we've reached um, that time uh, now. Uh, I want to thank you again, um, President Draghi, for attending here, and uh, I hope Sorry? Um, can you take a question from, from Senator Gavin? Because he did go out for a vote. Yes, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. Uh, Mr Draghi, you're welcome, first of all, just to say that, and thanks again, Chair. Mr Draghi, you are responsible for supervision of the banks of Europe. Your job is to protect the banks and not the people, unfortunately. 
For example, many of us are very concerned that the ECB has always relied on the single supervisory mechanism statute to shift responsibility for any kind of protection for consumers and distressed borrowers to the national competent authorities, who often fail to ensure that protection, in my view. You will be familiar with the tracker mortgage scandal, for example. The ECB say there should never need to be another bailout of the banks, but I'd like to put it to you, Mr Draghi, that there is an ongoing bailout of Irish banks. You'll be aware of the exorbitant interest rates they charge, they've been mentioned several times here today, but are you aware that the banks here don't have to pay any tax for up to 20 years? They've been given political permission to sell bad loans rather than work through them. Tax breaks like the Help to Buy scheme to keep up the price of houses and therefore mortgages have been introduced. Rural communities have seen their banking services closed down with no comment from the central bank and the government. It's the Irish people who pay for this ongoing bailout in higher interest rates, being sold to vultures and denial of bank services. You have the facts now, you can see the pattern. Will you act to stop the Irish people continuing to pay for the banks and their problems for another decade and more? Senator. Mr. Um, well, first, first of all, let me say that uh, the, uh, we have a separation. The uh, president of the ECB doesn't comment on supervisory issues. So that, because you said at the beginning, I'm the head. So, yes, technically that's true. I mean, legally that's true, but in fact, we never comment because we don't want to pollute or confuse the two areas of monetary policy and supervision. Um, second, many of the issues you mentioned have to do with misconduct. And to this extent, they really pertain to the area of consumer protection. And so they don't uh, really uh, pertain to what the ECB or the supervisory area of the ECB can do. It's not in our, it's not in our remit. Uh, third, this question and many others really dealt with the social consequences of uh, a banking system which is in a, as I said before, in a monopoly or quasi-monopoly situation, or has misperformed in the, in the, in, during the financial crisis. To this extent, I think to, to the possible extent, of course, the rules should be devised in a way that the banking system is stable and provides credit to the economy, to the real economy, and not necessarily provides credit only to the financial sector. Of the, of the economy. But all these social problems, the first and foremost instrument that governments have are social policies. So I think the two areas should be kept different in a sense, to some extent, at least to the possible extent. You want to intervene with the best instrument to achieve the objective in the most effective way. So if you have the socially distressed borrowers, you intervene with social policies. This has been done, by the way, in other countries as well. Thank you. Just to, thank you for your answer. Just to clarify, were you aware that the Irish banks here don't have to pay tax for the next 20 years? Well, the, I may be wrong on this, but my perception is that because of the gigantic losses they had in the past, they are allowed to kind of take them as a tax credit. No kind of about it. I'm sorry? Yes, exactly. Or yeah. is, it, is it correct? Mm. Yeah, is it correct? Yeah, yeah. And you've no view on that? But again, again, this is something that, I'm sorry, this is again something that, that really pertains to the fiscal and budgetary policy of the government, and not so much to the supervision, or certainly even less to the monetary policy side of the ECB. I suppose my final point, Chair, if I may, would be that the Irish government has adopted a banks first policy which undermines all of their policy making when it comes to the banking sector. The citizens and residents of the state are not well served by this policy and indeed are often victims of it. Is the ECB happy to ignore this ongoing bailout or will it investigate it? My final question. Again, you see, you deal. Imagine an ECB, let me put it the other way around. You're asking many things that maybe they have to be done, they're right, they should be done probably, but you're asking the ECB to take charge of all this. Imagine the ECB that takes charge of all the things you asked me to do today. 
He would kick the ECB out of Ireland immediately. He wouldn't stand. A <laughs> so, so it's, a, so it's a, uh, no, I understand these are very important issues, but there are things that the ECB cannot do, and uh, there, <laughs> that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks again, uh, President, uh, President Draghi. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned at 10 o'clock on Thursday, but we will resume our select committee at half past five. Thank you.